Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at the very least, on my review of On the Shortness of Life by Seneca. Life is long if you know how to use it. This is one of the Penguin Books' great ideas. It's actually book number one in the series, and I've been really enjoying the ones of these that I've picked up. As always, I'm going to read the blurb, then I'm going to go through it and check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... The stoic writings of the philosopher Seneca offer powerful insights into the art of living and the importance of reason and morality, and continue to provide profound guidance to many through their eloquence, lucidity, and timeless wisdom. So I enjoy, enjoyed the opening paragraph here. I think I might read the full thing because there's a lot of good stuff here. So Most human beings, Paulinus, complain about the meanness of nature because we are born for a brief span of life. And because this spell of time that has been given to us rushes by so swiftly and rapidly that with very few exceptions, life ceases for the rest of us just when we are getting ready for it. Nor is it just the man in the street and the unthinking mass of people who groan over this, as they see it, universal evil. The same feeling lies behind complaints from even distinguished men, hence the dictum of the greatest of doctors, Hippocrates, life is short, art is long. Hence too the grievance, most improper to a wise man, which Aristotle expressed when he was taking nature to task for indulging animals with such long existences that they can live through five or ten human lifetimes, while a far shorter limit is set for men who are born to a great and extensive destiny. It is not that we have a short time to live, but that we waste a lot of it. Life is long enough and a sufficiently generous amount has been given to us for the highest achievements if it were all well invested. But when it is wasted in heedless luxury and spent on no good activity, we are forced at last by death's final constraint to realise that it has passed away before we knew it was passing. So it is. We are not given a short life, but we make it short, and we are not ill-supplied, but wasteful of it. Just as when ample and princely wealth falls to a bad owner, it is squandered in a moment, but wealth, however modest, if entrusted to a good custodian, increases with use, so our lifetime extends amply if you manage it properly. And I thought this was a very interesting point. He says, Men do not let anyone seize their estates, and if there is the slightest dispute about their boundaries, they rush to stones and arms, but they allow others to encroach on their lives. Why, they themselves even invite in those who will take over their lives. You will find no one willing to share out his money, but to how many does each of us divide up his life? People are frugal in guarding their personal property, but as soon as it comes to squandering time, they are most wasteful of the one thing in which it is right to be stingy. I have a notification. And this sounds painful, he's talking about Livius Drusus. It is uncertain whether he died by his own hand, for he collapsed after receiving a sudden wound in the groin. Some people doubting whether his death was self-inflicted, but no one doubting that it was timely. Ooh, a wound to the groin. I reckon he was murdered because you wouldn't stab yourself in the crotch, would you? The great line, he says, Learning how to live takes a whole life and, which may surprise you more, it takes a whole life to learn how to die. And this is a great little paragraph. Life is divided into three periods, past, present and future. Of these, the present is short, the future is doubtful, the past is certain. For this last is the one over which fortune has lost her power, which cannot be brought back to anyone's control. But this is what preoccupied people lose, for they have no time to look back at their past, and even if they did, it is not pleasant to recall activities they are ashamed of. So they are unwilling to cast their minds back to times ill spent, which they dare not relive if their vices in recollection become obvious, even those vices whose insidious approach was disguised by the charm of some momentary pleasure. No one willingly reverts to the past unless all his actions have passed his own censorship, which is never deceived. The man who must fear his own memory is the one who has been ambitious in his greed, arrogant in his contempt, uncontrolled in his victories, treacherous in his deceptions, rapacious in his plundering, and wasteful in his squandering. And yet this is the period of our time which is sacred and dedicated, which has passed beyond all human risks and is removed from fortune's sway, which cannot be harassed by want or fear or attacks of illness. It cannot be disturbed or snatched from us. It is an untroubled, everlasting possession. In the present we have only one day at a time, each offering a minute at a time. But all the days of the past will come to your call. You can detain and expect them at your will, something which the preoccupied have no time to do. So he says, again, do you call those men leisure who spend many hours at the barbers simply to cut whatever grew overnight, to have a serious debate about every separate hair, to tidy up disarranged locks or to train thinning ones from the sides to lie over the forehead? How angry they... How angry they get if the barber has been a bit careless, as if he were trimming a real man. How they flare up if any of their mane is wrongly cut off, if any of it is badly arranged, or if it doesn't all fall into the right ringlets. Which of them would not rather have his country ruffled than his hair? Which would not be more anxious about the elegance of his head than its safety? Which would not rather be trim than honourable? Do you call those men leisured who divide their time between the comb and the mirror? And what about those who busy themselves in composing, listening to or learning songs while they distort their voice, whose best and simplest tone nature intended to be the straight one, into the most unnatural modulations, who are always drumming with their fingers as they beat time to an imagined tune, whom you can hear humming to themselves even when they are summoned on a serious, often even sorrowful affair. Theirs is not leisure, but indolent occupation. 
He talks about knowing pointless facts. So he says, It used to be a Greek failing to want to know how many oarsmen Ulysses had, whether the Iliad or the Odyssey was written first, and whether too they were by the same author, and other questions of this kind, which if you keep them to yourself in no way enhance your private knowledge, and if you publish them make you appear more a bore than a scholar. But now the Romans too have been afflicted by the pointless enthusiasm for useless knowledge. Recently I heard somebody reporting which Roman general first did this or that. Julius first won a naval battle. Curious Dentatus first included elephants in a triangle. So far these facts, even if they do not contribute to real glory, at least are concerned with exemplary services to the state. Such knowledge will not do us any good, but it interests us because of the appeal of these pointless facts. I don't know, I like pointless facts. And just another great line here. Can the knights which they purchase so dearly not seem much too short to these people? They lose the day in waiting for the night, and the night in fearing the dawn. And he talks about how to make life seem longer as well, and one of his tips is, he says, We must be especially careful in choosing people and in deciding whether they are worth devoting a part of our lives to them, whether the sacrifice of our time makes a difference to them. For some people actually charge us for our services to them. Athenodorus says he would not even go to dinner with a man who did not thereby feel indebted to him. And I thought this was interesting, uh, bearing in mind, you know, COVID. He says, It follows that just as at a time of an epidemic disease, we must take care not to sit beside people whose bodies are infected with feverish disease, because we shall risk ourselves and suffer from their breathing upon us. So in choosing our friends for their characters, we shall take care to find those who are the least corrupted. And great quote, he says, What is the point of having countless books and libraries whose titles the owner could scarcely read through in his whole lifetime? And, um, you know, that's why you should try and read all of the books that you own. And we learned about um, uh, Canus, says he spent the 10 days leading up to his execution without any anxiety at all. It is incredible what that man said, what he did, how calm he remained. He was playing drafts when the centurion who was dragging off a troop of condemned men ordered him to be summoned too. At the call he counted his pieces and said to his companion, See that you don't falsely claim after my death that you won. Then nodding to the centurion he said, You will be witness that I am leading by one piece. What a way to go. So yeah, On the Shortness of Life by Seneca, lots of feed for thought, very philosophical. I've just really enjoyed everything by Seneca that I've read so far, and this is sort of no exception. So I gave On the Shortness of Life a 4 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of On the Shortness of Life by Seneca. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought. If you read this book, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.